There are definitely those who think that Latter-day Saint women are somehow secondary or less important or even quote unquote oppressed. To that, I always think, do I look oppressed? Do I act oppressed? Nonetheless, be that as it may, I think that one of the powerful messages of this collection is that it shows that from day one, we've been teaching the gospel and teaching it with a lot of power, with power and with persuasion. In 1979, Church President Spencer W. Kimball prophesied that the day would come when good women would be drawn to the church in large numbers because of the righteousness and example of women of the church. Then in October 2015, President Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles declared that that day and those women are now. My dear sisters, he said, whatever your calling, whatever your circumstances, we need your impressions, your insight, your inspiration. We need you to speak up and speak out. Before he gave that talk, he called me into his office and read me every word of that talk. At that time, that was in August, before he gave it in October, of last year, and he, um, he had told me it was his 26th draft at that time, his 26th draft, and this was the first week in August. And he wanted to make sure that what he had said would resonate with the sisters. That's that same thought again. You know, a, a man speaking to a, a woman is different than a woman speaking to a woman. But I have to tell you, as I sat there and he read that talk to me, I wept through the entire time as he was reading it. Elder Nelson has a unique understanding of women. He has nine daughters, and I know four of them personally because they have lived in my stake. And so um, him reading that talk to me was I'm sure like reading it to maybe one of his daughters. And I was so appreciative of his tender, tender feeling that he wanted to get this right. I assured him he did. This is a time when women's history is being emphasized by the, Latter -day, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and by the Church Historian's Press. This is the second volume uh, in two years to come out from the Church Historian's Press that is devoted to a careful study of Mormon women's history. When a book is published by the Church Historian's Press, that means it has gone through a number of approvals. At the Pulpit was approved by the Correlation Department. It was approved by the executives of the Church History Department. It was approved by our Apostle Advisors, and it was approved by the First Presidency of the Church. The discourses in this volume span the history of the Church up to the modern day. One of the contributors is Sister Yuda B. Busha. She was born and raised in Germany and joined the church in 1958. She's the wife of Elder F. Enzio Busha of the 70. She gave this talk at a BYU Women's Conference April 6, 1990. It is titled, The Unknown Treasure. God works through the power of His love. When we truly learn to love God, we learn to love all things, others, ourselves, everything, because God is in all, with all, and through all. We don't need to be afraid, and we don't have to hide behind a facade of performance. When we come to understand this unknown treasure in us, 
when we have the knowledge of who we really are, we are entitled to the power that came from God. It will come when we ask for it and we, when we trust His leadership in our lives. We just came back from our assignment as a temple president. I was a matron from in Germany, Frankfurt Temple. And uh, I had a lot, I was in the laundry, I remember, and uh, a telephone came and there was this call from Sister Hawkins. And she said, I was already on the panel from this women's conference. And then she said, we made a decision and planned and want to ask you if you are willing to give the main talk in the Marriott Center. And, uh, and she told me the theme, the power within. Of course, I nearly wanted to faint. I was not prepared for this. And uh, I thought I cannot do this. With my poor English, the spirit still talks to me in German. And, uh, uh, but I could not e escape. As it comes more and more the, that we all know that we are children of our Heavenly Father, and He gave every person this gift within, the power within. <laughs> Many are looking outside. It's not outside. The women who speak in this volume do so from multiple places of authority, often overlapping places of authority. For some, like Elaine Jack, the authority comes from having a high church position. When Elaine Jack addressed the college students uh, for the discourse that's in our book, she did so as general president of the Relief Society. But she also had 15 years of experience before becoming president of working on Relief Society curriculum and she had experience as a counselor in the Young Women Presidency. So she had a lot of curriculum and leadership experience that she brought to that address. Sister Jack gave this talk titled, Get a Life, at a church education fireside in January 1993. Another woman wrote me that she had lost hope of ever finding a man she could marry. She described in detail her failed relationships and efforts to find a husband. She talked about her diminished feelings of self-worth and her questions about whether or not the Lord really loved her as she'd been taught in church all her life. She has a good job, good health, good friends, good family. And yet she spoke of life in dismal terms and referred to herself as a second-class citizen in the church. Fully realizing that I don't walk in either woman's shoes and that each has justified concerns, I still want to give this bit of counsel. Get a life. <laughs> we are sons and daughters of God. We have the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to rise, not wallow. Brothers and sisters, let's get a life. I feel a positive attitude is one of the most important characteristics that anybody could have. And many people were feeling downtrodden and unhappy and unappreciated. And I felt that if they could recognize the value of their own lives, what good was in their lives, that they would feel happier. They would be a more satisfied and giving kind of woman. So when I said, get a life, I thought, appreciate what you have recognize the goodness around you, the goodness in other people, what good was in your life. And I felt that the scriptures that I chose for that talk identified this point. Get a life. Don't wallow in what you wish you had. Another landmark discourse in this volume was delivered by Sister Sherry L. Dew, May 4, 2001, at a BYU Women's Conference. This doctrinally rich talk is titled, Knowing Who You Are and Who You Have Always Been. We talk all the time in the church about being sons and daughters of God, which of course I 
believed and do believe. But I wanted to understand more about what it meant to be a member of the House of Israel. I wanted to understand more about what it meant to be living in the latter part of the latter days. So I started to study. I started to read the, the teachings of prophets, seers, and revelators. I poured through the scriptures. And one of the key impressions I had is that Yes, understanding our identity is crucial. When you understand who you are, it shapes everything you do. It shapes your decisions, the ways you handle yourself in your life, uh, the way you try to, to move forward in your life. So I came to have a new perception about the power and the importance of identity. But the other thing that became very clear to me was that this isn't just about who I am or who you are. It's about who we've always been. Listen to these words from President Hinckley. Quote, woman is God's supreme creation. Of all the creations of the Almighty, there is none more inspiring than a daughter of God who walks in virtue with an understanding of why she should do so. Rise above the dust of the world. Know that you are daughters of God and that there is for you a great work to be done which cannot be left to others, unquote. My dear sisters, Will you seek to remember, with the help of the Holy Ghost, who you are and who you have always been? Will you remember that you stood by our Savior without flinching? Remember that you were reserved for now because you would have the courage and the determination to face the world at its worst and to help raise and lead a chosen generation. Remember the covenants you have made and the power they carry. Remember that you are noble and great and a potential heir of all our Father has. Remember that you are the daughter of the King. April 28, 2011. Sister Virginia Pierce, first counselor in the Young Women General Presidency, delivered the keynote address at the BYU Women's Conference. Her talk is titled, Prayer a small and simple thing. There's that beginning part of a talk where you just say, oh, uh, what, does, what does God want me to say? What is, what is my part in this? And what am I bringing to this subject? And I couldn't figure it out. And, and there was a layered sense of that of they, the people who asked me, have asked me to speak about this subject and I'm not resonating. I can't feel that. And I was discussing that with a trusted friend one day and she said, Virginia, what do you want to talk about? Forget what they asked you to talk about. What do you want to talk about? And at that moment, I, I said, I want to talk about prayer. That's where I am. And she said, then talk about it. You can connect that to whatever subject they gave you, and, and the subject was small and simple things. And, and in that moment, I thought, oh yes, this is the smallest and most simplest um, religious practice we have. It's prayer. And that's what I want to talk about, because that is what sustains me. I tell you this by way of personal testimony. Prayer works. It does indeed call down the powers of heaven. It reconciles our will with the will of the Father. It consecrates even our most aversive experiences to the welfare of our souls. Through combined prayer, we experience love, unity, and power that is impossible to describe. We may not be granted that which we desire, but we end up grateful with all of our hearts for that which the Lord gives us. And along the way, we experience tender mercies over and over, those unmistakable messages from Him. I am here, I love you, you are living my life with your life with my approval. Everything will work together for your good. Trust me. I would emphasize again, and I believe I did that in the talk, that one of the great miracles of prayer is not the outcome, you know, did I get the outcome I wanted? The power of prayer is what it does. 
in terms of my relationship with God, my relationship with Him. And my persistence in prayer when it doesn't feel like I'm being answered is a big part of that relationship. I, I see it as a way that I say to Him, I'm with you. <laughs> Um, I will keep kneeling down, I will keep praying, even when I feel like there's no answer coming, because I have nowhere else to go. And uh, so the power of prayer is that sooner or later, um, He sends messages to me that are uh, magnificent in their smallness. They're usually very small messages but they are powerful because they are an indication that He heard me. Sister Gladys Satati and her husband, Elder Joseph Satati of the Seventy, are from Kenya. They joined the church in 1986. Elder Satati is the first black African general authority. Sister Satati holds a degree in education and has served in many capacities as a teacher. In April of 2016, Sister Satati delivered the keynote address at the BYU Women's Conference. It is titled, Resolving Conflicts Using Gospel Principles. As I considered the topic of our discussion, I wondered if there is anyone I know who has lived a life without conflict and contention. Contention comes easily, even with those who truly love and desire the best for. It is difficult to always be on guard and to always remember who we are when those we love and are close to us do things that we sincerely disagree with or things that provoke us. Let me mention a few areas from which contention between people can arise. First, lack of communication, which leads to misunderstanding, wrong expectations, undesirable conclusions, distrust, and suspicion. Two, making right judgments and assumptions about others which leads to misrepresentation of other people's intentions and hurting other people's feelings. Three, a competitive spirit driven by pride, which fuels dislike, feelings of anger, isolation in others. Four, differing character of values, which often lead to distrust, suspicion, prejudice, and profiling of others. Conflict and contention is not inevitable. What we do to prevent or escalate it is a choice we make. In, in Africa, we are a big, big family. Um, your uncles, your aunts, we are all close to each other. It's like when one of them has a problem, you also have a problem. It will, you will get to know about it. And if you are in a position to help, you do it. And so when those struggles come and sometimes members of our families lose faith, I, I, I just find myself asking them to have faith and to have hope. And um, I know that it, it works. The last talk we feature was delivered to a general church audience September 2015. The talk is titled, Our Sabbath Day Gifts. The speaker, Sister Linda K. Burton, Relief Society General President. 20 years ago, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said something in general conference that sank deep into my heart. As I felt my heart burn within me, I knew the Holy Ghost was confirming to me that what Elder Maxwell was teaching was not only true, but meant especially for me. It feels applicable to how we observe the Sabbath day. He said, the submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. 
It is the only possession which is truly ours to give. And it was recently, you know, six months earlier, Elder Nelson had spoken about the Sabbath day. And we like to speak with one voice with the brethren. We feel like we have a complimentary opportunity to stand as a second witness of what the brothers pri brethren priorities are. And so this was an opportunity for me to speak up and say, we concur with this. And, and this is what it looks like to me to keep the Sabbath day holy. I wanted to show that it's six months later and we haven't forgotten, it's not a flash in the pan. We want to keep this, this idea going. We're not going to stop keeping the Sabbath day holy because it was sp spoken of once. And this is just a sample of the feast awaiting in this new volume at the pulpit. I want women's lives, experiences, triumphs, and words to be more readily available for all church members because I believe those words and experiences will save us. They will help us to return to our Father in heaven. They will help us better understand how to fulfill our missions here on earth. I'm Glenn Rawson. Thank you for joining us. For History of the Saints DVDs, books, audiobooks, and more, go to historyofthesaints.org.